Hey guys, Dr. Jamie. I don't know if you guys know this, but almost 75% of Americans are dehydrated. You all know I'm a huge fan of electrolyte supplementation and most Americans are drinking less than 44 ounces of water per day. Well, one thing that might be able to help you get rehydrated and drink more water is by the use of electrolytes. And I wanna introduce you to the Vitamin IQ New Electrolyte Mix. This is the crucial aspect of your wellness. It is intelligent hydration. Not only does it have three times the electrolytes of any sports drink, but it also has a cellular energy blend of D-ribose, taurine, creatine, and NAD precursors. It comes in a delicious orange flavor that my kids love. So if you're looking for a new electrolyte supplement, go check out Vitamin IQ on Amazon or vitaminiq.com. To the Fit and Fabulous Podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Jamie, and welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous Podcast. It is so wonderful to have you here today. I have an incredible guest on today's podcast that you will not want to miss. I've been really looking forward to this recording here. So I want to introduce you. This bio is a little bit long, but I want to get through it because you guys are going to be impressed, and then we have some really great things to talk about. Kirk Parsley completed SEAL training at 19 years old and served as a SEAL during the first Gulf War. He left the SEAL community in 1994 to pursue a college education. He then re-entered the U.S. Navy to attend the military's medical school in Bethesda, Maryland, and was commissioned as an officer in the Navy in 2000. After completing medical school, internship, and residency, Kirk returned to the SEAL teams as a physician for the West Coast SEAL teams. The realities of eight years of nearly continuous combat were beginning to weigh in the SEALs, and Kirk was tasked with optimizing and maintaining the performance of the most performant men in the world. It was during this period that he was struck by the disparity between healthcare and health. Dr. Parsley was then forced to learn enormous amounts of alternative medicine literature, synthesize and apply it in a way that was both effective and practical for the SEALs to maintain their peak performance 365 days a year. Performance and fitness are not the same thing, according to Dr. Parsley, and due to the limitation and restrictions of medical interventions that are allowable for men working in austere environments, he was able to do this with unprecedented success, so much that he is still the go-to medical human performance expert for not only Navy SEALs, but all military special forces, and has parlayed his experience into private consulting, including professional sports teams, international corporations, entrepreneurs, and executives. He works with thousands of elite performers and has had tremendous success in optimizing the physical, cognitive, and emotional performance with these individuals. His philosophy is simple. We inhabit a 100,000-plus-year-old model of the human body, and we perform best by approximating the life that we evolved to live and aiming towards the health metrics of our 25-year-old selves. In his experience, 80% of health comes from focusing on sleep, nutrition, exercise, and stress mitigation with a strong emphasis on sleep. And we're going to talk so much about that today. He's certified in hyperbaric medicine, anti-aging medicine, hormone replacement therapy, and is currently working towards a national certification in psychedelic medicine. He runs his practice supplement business out of Austin, Texas, is an avid outdoorsman and fitness fanatic. Where he's not wor- When he's not working or working out, he can be found on Lake Travis on some sort of watercrafts. So, Dr. Kirk Parsley, welcome to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Thank you. That was a great, well, that was a great bio intro. I, I love that. Uh, I'm giving, I mean, I've never wrote that. I've never, I've never heard that before. So it, it, I'm inspired. You, you sound like an incredible human. Yeah. I don't even know if it needs a cherry <laughs> on top. You definitely made me sound way better than I am. So I, I owe somebody something. I don't know. Well, we, we certainly want to know all your secrets of being a high performer, but tell us what it's like to go into the seals at age 19. Well, when I, when I went, uh, and in 1988, that you know that was the norm, I and mean, seals were uh, actually kind of like the Dirty Dozen movie, uh, kind of a bunch of misfits. All those stories you hear about people uh, going, a judge telling them, "Hey, you're going to jail or the military." Like, you know, that that was kind of our group. <laughs> you know, we we were kind of a ragtag uh, bunch of guys that were just resilient, and tough, and dumb, and they could just beat on us all day, and we kept doing it. And so, like, you make it through training and. Uh, and, and training is really just a beat down. It's all about this, uh, 
you know, overextending you, doing more work than you can do, not giving you enough sleep, not giving you enough food, making you know, cold all the time, confused all the time, like make impossible tasking all the time. And it's really just a, it's a test to see if you'll quit. And that's kind of what SEAL training is. And then once they decide you're a good enough guy to train, then when you get out of buds and then you go to the SEAL team, you have to learn how to be a SEAL. But, it, you know, it obviously we're young, when we're younger, we're more resilient, right? We have uh, like we recover faster. We can we can get by with less sleep and still perform well. Um, you know, we nutrition is, doesn't seem as important. Uh, you know, at those ages, you know, you can just kind of live off of macaroni and cheese and ham sandwiches and and still right. be and you know still perform well. However, that works. And um, and so, it, you know that that was you know that that was I think kind of ideal. Nowadays, uh, it's so competitive to get in because they have such a big name. Still, seems to have such a a big sort of mystique around them, sort of a, almost a quasi celebrity status. And it's super competitive to get in now. Like I, I, I couldn't get into SEAL training now. I, I wouldn't have enough qualifications. Uh, I mean, it, it's just a really, but it's, it's a great group of guys and it was a great place to grow up. It was a great place to spend your twenties. Um, you know, I got out at tw- about right, right, right before I turned 25. Um, and I mean, what a, what a great, way to spend those years you know getting trained to do all the cool stuff that 20 something year old men want to do you know like yeah jumped out of planes and fired you know every kind of weapon known to man learned how to be good at everything did rock climbing courses and mountaineering courses and riverine courses jungle training uh you know explosives sand rails like we drive those doom buggies learn how to you know navigate at night with nvgs driving humvees and like just all the cool things that yeah. young man wants to do and uh, got paid to do it. I mean, he didn't get paid much, but, but you know, right. uh, we didn't have time to spend any money either because we were always- Sounds like medical money. residency. Yeah, it's a lot like, it's a lot like you do that. a shit ton of work. We're not going to pay you much, but okay, there's a lot of pride and glory in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but, so hey, then that's what you did. You you right, served right. and then you went back to medical school. So you are yeah, I was, crazy. <laughs> I was so smart that I decided I needed to beat myself down again and- uh, you know, you know, but you know, I think that's kind of what it is, right? Like the first kind of half of our life, we're proving ourselves yeah. to others and proving ourselves to ourselves. And like, what yeah. am I really capable of? And like, you know, putting it out there and like that external gratification is something we really draws us, you know, now at this age, like, I don't know, obviously like, I don't care, like whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a little I different do anything like that again. Now I was like, no, 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 no. Uh, um, a little different like perspective that. now. Yeah. 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 yeah but, okay. So you, yeah, so yeah. you serve, you serve, you are in the Gulf War, you come back, you go to medical school. Like why, why medicine? What kind of drew you to that? Uh, well, actually I, I wasn't planning on being a, a doctor when I got out of the military. Um, and, and to clarify, I was in during the Gulf War. I didn't go to the Gulf War. I went to, I was in the Philippines. So I don't want anybody, I, I, don't, I want to steal anybody's valor. Um, that was just the time period I was in. Um, but I, uh, um, I lost my, what was the question? What was it? <laughs> Why'd you go into medicine? I mean, why be a oh, doctor, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. after all that? When I got, yeah. When I got out, I was, uh, it's, the part I skipped over is I was actually, I'm actually a high school dropout. Um, and, and not by a small margin, by a huge margin. Uh, like I, yeah. I wasn't anywhere close to graduating high school. Um, I'd been a terrible student my whole life. I started getting D's and F's in third grade and like, you know, just skimmed by and everything. And after four wow. years of high school, I was a sophomore, uh, by credits, uh, but none of my friends knew. Uh, and so I wasn't going to stick around <laughs> and graduate or anything. So I, I joined the military, I got a GED, joined the military, went to SEAL training. Um, and then. You know, you know, because we'd had that Gulf War, which was a flash and, uh, you, know, you know, the Clinton administration, we were kind of used like the world's police force. And it was just a lot of uh, redundancies, like the same kind of trips training over and over again, same types of uh, the police action over and over again. And it, and it just like it was I was really glad that I did it, but it just kind of seemed like I've gotten out of this what I could get of it. And that's, you know, in part because I'm 20 four years old and I'm arrogant and I think that I actually know what I'm doing, which of course I, I didn't know what I was doing. I just thought I was good at what I was doing. Um, and, uh, but anyway, I, I decided, you know, it's kind of a young singles man's job and it, and, 
you know, 30 in the teams is old. So like I was getting close to not being a young guy anymore. And, uh, and I was in love with a girl and I, uh, you know, and thinking about getting married and all that. And so I said, well, I'm going to get out and do something else. Um, I, I really liked, uh, my, the girl I was dating who became my wife, uh, was, uh, in physical therapy school when I was dating her, when I was in the SEAL teams and, and I read a lot of her textbooks and I was always interested in that type of stuff. You know, I was reading, you know, fitness books and nutrition books when I was a kid and um, I was interested in helping myself perform. But I thought, well, you know, I'll go do something kind of like that. Maybe PT was that I was like the high end of what I thought I might be able to do uh, more like more like, yeah. like an athletic trainer or something like that. Um, and so I started volunteering at San Diego Sports Medicine Center to get uh, my volunteer hours. Because you have to have 2,000 hours of volunteer hours to just apply to PT school. Um, and so I started volunteering. And then they hired me as an aide. And then I worked there the whole time I was in college. But uh, pretty quickly decided I didn't want to be a PT. It was a little too limited for me. Um, but health is a healthcare mecca. Every practitioner you could ever imagine we had in this facility. and. Uh, there were some younger doctors there that, you know, we were only like four or five years apart in age and, um, and, you know, kind of befriended them. And they're like, you should go to medical school. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, you know, punk, punk, you know, pump the brakes, Sparky, you, <laughs> you know, like easy. I, uh, <laughs> I'm not even close to that. Right. And, uh, and this doctor who ran the clinic, he, he overhears this conversation. Um, and, uh, he comes out of his office, doctor, his name is Dr. Lee Rice. He still practices in San Diego. Amazing man. Uh, and he comes out and says, Kirk, the question isn't, can you get into medical school? The question is, would you go if you could get in? And I said, of course. And he said, well, then you really got to try, don't you? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. So he kind of guilted me into it, honestly. And I, I was like, well, I guess I, yeah, I'm going to try. And so, uh, you know, when, when I went to apply to medical school, I was already married. I already had kids. I found out that the military had their own medical school. I wasn't actually a good fit for the military. I'm not a, you know, Spartan, like do what you're told kind of guy. Like I'm a, well, why are we doing it that way? And what about this? And uh, you're like, I'm not sure we, you know, and like, you know, I, I don't fit well <laughs> in, in the general. So you're a good scientist. Team. You ask questions. Yeah. 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 But in, in the SEAL teams, that was fine because in the, the SEALs are always, always willing to come up with a better idea of how to do something. And then uh, from what people told me is like, Hey, if you're a doctor in the military, like they just expect to be a doctor, like all that military crap's gone. Um, and so I found out the military had their own medical school and I'm like, you know, I can support my family while going to medical school. And so I'll do that. Um, I was pretty sure I wanted to do orthopedics. And um, so I, you know, I went in uh, with that plan thinking that I would get to go back to my community and like give back to the, to the SEAL teams. I was like the, you know, the organization that kept me out of prison and made me in, into a good, into a good young man, you know? And so, uh, that was, that was kind of the plan. That's how I en ended up there. I was really well steeped in sports medicine and ortho. Um, like, you know, my, you know, my, the, the Navy lets you start residency. You do like a year, then you have to go out and work in the fleet. That's how they get general practitioners. You have to go out for a couple mm -hmm. of years and then you can come back and finish. And so everything I'd done was lined up for ortho. And of course, and like I told you, the whole time I was in college, which was six years because, you know, I had a high school GED. I had to go to junior college for two years to be able to get into college. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, I, 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 I had uh, all of, you know, all, all of all of that was lined up for me to be really well versed in what I thought SEALs needed, which was sports medicine right and mm -hmm. um and i got there at an opportune time when we we're building our first our very first sports medicine facility which is hard for people to believe but 2009 was the first was wow. the time we first started to build our own rehab like where we had pts and you know athletic trainers and ptas and acupuncture and pain rounds and ortho rounds and all this coming through so i got this super i got there in time to supervise the build out of that and we hired our first nutritionist our first strength and conditioning coach our first trainers our first pts and you know de started designing our own sort of rehab and our and mm -hmm. our own real training and um and then i was the dumbest guy around because we had brought in all these experts from the olympic training center and professional sports teams and and in the military when you're the dumbest guy they say well you're uh you're going to supervise you're you're being charged so like, you're in charge so that was really my job <laughs> was supervising this facility of you know 
50 people who knew orders yeah. of magnitude more than I did. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and then that led to, um, you know, the career I'm in now because the SEALs, are, they're like professional athletes. The worst thing you can possibly do is put them on the bench, uh, like taking them out of their platoon. They, they'd literally rather be shot. Uh, mm -hmm. and, they, and, uh, so they don't trust doctors because doctors can, disqualify them and if you come in there with something interesting that, is, that might be that might be a disease that might require medication you're disqualified until that's uh hammered out and so they came and talked to me because they trusted me i would i had been a seal recently enough to where there were still a ton of seals there that i had trained with and deployed with um and so they trusted me i had a good enough reputation for guys to go well let's go see if this guy can help yeah. us. And then they all came in telling me the same story, um, you know, which was kind of like this metabolic syndrome kind of picture, but they uh. ripped six pack abs, you know, 28, 32 years old. Uh, but you know, concentration, memory issues, motivation issues, mood issues, libido, erectile issues, uh, body comp shifts, so like they're working with the nutritionist, working with the trainers, working with the strength and conditioning coach, you know, getting but they're starting to lack the resiliency they had in their twenties. <laughs> and so, yeah, you know, so, you know, what medical school's like, right? So I, I had no idea. <laughs> like, I don't know, you don't have any diseases, so I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And, and that's what led to me having to learn so much that was really, you know, what we call now performance medicine. That's really what it was. I was just like the, yeah. These guys had a disease, just none of them were performing at the level that they wanted to. And, uh, you know, a lot of that, again, was lifestyle. But a big component of it was uh, was them using sleep aids. Um, they were the military handed out Ambien. I mean, that was the days when Ambien was thought to be completely benign, like, oh, take this yeah. and sleep and no side effects. Um, and then, you know, like most doctors, I didn't know anything about sleep, <laughs> but I said, well, let me, let me look in and see if, you know, this medication has any side effects that could, but then you have, you know, all, all you can learn is like the mechanism of actions and whatever limited research they presented, you know, uh, side effect profiles. And so I had to learn what happens when you sleep. And once I learned what happens during your, during sleep, I thought, man, that's, this could explain everything. <laughs> like, I, I, yeah. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I wasn't dumb enough to think it would, but I was like, yeah, it could like every single symptom they're complaining about, um, is, is a symptom of chronic sleep deprivation or chronic insomnia. And so I'm like, let's see if we get them off these sleep drugs and, you know, and, and, you know, they were already doing nutrition, working with our nutritionist, but you know, I hounded on that and I worked with our nutritionist and I worked with our strength and conditioning coaches um, you know, to kind of rehab guys off of dependency of sleep drugs. And, you know, Ambien mm. destroys about 80% of REM sleep and 20% of deep sleep and alcohol does the opposite. And if you know, you know, the SEAL community, any kind of high, you know, high level, high performing organization like that, if one is good, two is better, you know, three is great. So like they're overdosing on Ambien and chasing that down with, you know, five beers or three cocktails or something. Um, and so yeah. I would do sleep studies on them and there would be come back 99.9% .9 stage two sleep. <laughs> and, and I was like, wow, I don't know how you're surviving this to be honest. Now that I know a little bit about, yeah. sleep, I don't know how you're, but of course that was destroying the hormonal. You can't live like this. And, and that was destroying, yeah. uh, you know, their, you know, they were super inflamed and high, high oxidation, and like just a, a high catabolic picture and a very low anabolic picture. And, uh, you know, the military is not about to let me start giving hormones to SEALs. Um, mm. that, that's just, you know, politically too risky. There's going to be an admiral on CNN explaining why all SEALs are on steroids, right? So I couldn't do that. So, yeah. like, well, let, let's see what happens, you know, if we give them some supplements to push things that way. And then we get them sleeping well and get them off of sleep drugs and get them to minimize the alcohol. And then I had guys triple, quadruple their, you know, Tolan free testosterone and IGF one and like you know their HSCRP went from a five point eight to an immeasurable. Their insulin sensitivity was way better. Like and they just became metabolically healthier, and then of course they started performing better. And then the community is yeah. very performance oriented. So once a few guys start getting results, everybody's jumping on board. And 
Uh, and I was able, you know, not because I'm brilliant, just because the timing and what was needed and, uh, you know, you kind of forced upon me to learn this and I was able to make a really big impact on the community. And, uh, and I and still to this day, they trust me and, you know, they call me when they're having problems, uh, guys retiring, guys in, it's like, uh, they, I, I'm, I'm still a, a big resource for them, which is source of pride for me, like feels great, <laughs> you know? To, to be able to give back like that. That's incredible. Yeah. You know, reading your bio, you're talking about making this, you know, realization, the difference between healthcare and health. You have these guys coming to you. They don't want to be diagnosed with the condition. They want to reverse it or prevent it or whatever you want to call it. And I right. went through that same epiphany. It was with my own health struggles and went back into the integrative medicine uh, fellowship and I practice very differently than my colleagues. Um, and it's not accepted, right? It's not, you know, you're right. saying like, it's, <laughs> it's just not how doctors practice. It's not what they expect you to do. So your belief I, I, is that sleep, I, I nutrition, literally... exercise. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we, we, I mean, we have the same, we have the same thought process in all of this. So I'm just sitting over here, slow clapping. <laughs> I, I was, uh, I was literally shut down and investigated several times while I was yeah. doing this voodoo because it was not surprised. Care. Like I was giving Myers cocktails and that was beyond yeah. my scope. And I got, so this is know, IV therapy for people listening. It's just like IV nutrients. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, I'm like, as a doctor, I can't give IV vitamins. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like vitamins and minerals. Like what? Um, you know, and, and, you know, I used a remedex as an aromatase inhibitor to, because the, you know, they had an estrogen of 96 and a total testosterone of 200. And I'm like, well, let's shift that around, you know, like, let's, let's give them a chance. And like, you're given a cancer drug. I'm like, no, you moron. <laughs> it's not a cancer yeah. drug. Like, it, it, you know, it, uh, yeah. So, but this know, is, I mean, this, I mean Kirk, this is. is such a good example. This is such a good example is there is just this indoctrination that you get trained and you, you live in the algorithm, you live in the recommendations of the societies. And if you do anything outside of that, they scare you so much that you're in the danger zone. You're going to be investigated. They're going to take your medical license. I mean, right. you literally just feel like a hamster on a wheel and it does not encourage out of the box thinking. Right. And like, I mean, and, creativity, and that is where and, and it, fact, it's so harmful. The box, if you get outside of the box, even if your patients love you like, and what happened to me is like all my patients are getting amazing results, but other doctors like senior doctors, like senior doctors at the hospital or higher up in view med yeah. administrators, those were the ones cracking down on me because I was going outside the algorithm. And we know, you know, as physicians, we could have, we could have outcomes that are an order of magnitude better than our peers. And they could take us to court, put, and then they'll put a couple of gray haired wire rimmed Harvard doctors in their white coats up there and go, Dr. Parsley did not follow the standard of care and this and that, and you're guilty. And it's like, yep. and, and you know, somebody's going to sue you or take your license or whatever. And it's like, like what I did worked and everybody's healthier and, uh, but yeah. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's so true. So you've got this belief that basically 80% of our health comes from sleep, nutrition, exercise, and, and stress. I couldn't, couldn't be more excited about that statement. I wrote a book last year called hard to kill that talks about the five pillars, which you've, wow. which you've named, you know, four right there. Yeah. So let's, let's dive back into this sleep thing. For, and you know, why do people have problems with sleep to begin with? Why can't people just lay down and go to sleep? Well, the, the initiating problem, especially uh, a seal, you'd think they're real tired. <laughs> well, and they, and they are, and they are, but you also have to remember. So the, the, the initial, the initial problem of all of this, um, and, and it's prevalent to, to this day. Now, keep in mind, this was when I was trying to preach this to the SEAL teams in 2009, 2010, there was nobody talking about sleep yet. I mean, there was like one book on sleep lights out and like everything else was just like sleep research, you know? Uh, and it was, you know, bench top boring, like not, nothing super applicable. And, uh, and when I, when I first started talking about this and I was saying, you know, we, you know, this is going to affect our people's hormones and all this other stuff like that, that motivated people when I started talking to them about testosterone and growth hormone. But the truth of the matter is, is that most of society and our profession and my first profession are probably the two worst professions in the world that they just don't value sleep, right? It, it's, 
it's actually a badge of honor to be able to keep working and not need sleep. Mm-hmm. And in fact, in SEAL training, we select for people who can tolerate sleep deprivation well because we have a week in buds where you don't sleep for a week. So it's, uh, you know, from Sunday, like basically you get up Sunday morning and then you don't, you don't sleep again until Friday afternoon. And, mm-hmm. uh, and you're running around the whole time. And like we're screening, of course, we're screening for possibly psychotic, you know, psychotic breaks and so forth in that age group and a predisposition of that. But we're also just screening for people who can function well doing that. Um, and then of course, you know, medical, medical school and internship, you know, uh, you know, clinical, you know, hospital rotations in third and fourth year, and then your internships and residency, it's like, you know, what, you know, call every other day, maybe call every third night. And like, you know, you're working for 36 hours straight and going home and like trying to spend some time with your friends and family, whatever, do a little, have a little life and go to sleep and like chronic sleep deprivation. And as a society, like we have these axioms, like, you know, sleep is for the week or I'll get all the sleep I need when I'm dead or, you know, like all this stuff. And, and it really, you know, uh, William DeMent, sort of the godfather of sleep medicine, like his hypothesis, which seems sound to me is you could trace it back to sort of industrialization and rural electrification. So when people could work, you know, when people were working in an agrarian age, like you, there's no work to be done at night. Like <laughs> you go to sleep and you get up when the sun's uh, getting close to get up. So you can, uh, when the sun's getting close to coming up, so you have enough light to do your work. Um, but you know, when we had, once we had rural electrification and everybody had light bulbs and then we had people in factories turning cranks and whatever, uh, time was money. And like the less sleep you did, the more, the more work you could do. And then the more work you could do, the more money you had, the more money you had, the better life you could provide for your kids and better family and better. And so that's, that, that momentum in society really hasn't gone away. It's, it's been demuted a little bit in the last 10 years, but it's not huge. I mean, it's not a huge change. I'd. I'd say maybe it's gone down 10%. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, I've worked with thousands and thousands of clients uh, on lifestyle. And, you know, of course, sleep is, is uh, in my opinion, like, uh, you know, I don't even call sleep a pillar anymore. I call sleep's the foundation that the other pillars sit on uh, because yeah. it's so important. And, uh, you know, people come to me, they've read my book, they've seen my TED talk, they've heard me on podcasts, they know what I stand for. And it's still the hardest thing for me to get people to do. Like I could say, yeah, I want you to exercise five hours a day. And they'd be like, all right, five hours a day. And I'd say, I want you to eat nothing but kale. And they'd be like, all right, nothing but kale. And I like, I want you to meditate two hours. And okay. And I'd say, you need to sleep eight hours. And they're like, whoa, whoa I, I don't have time to do that. I don't even need that. Like I've, you know, I've been doing this my whole life. I sleep five hours. And, um, and that's the biggest problem. And so with everything that I do, the most ironically, <laughs> and, and, you know, and I'm, and I'm, I'm always trying to work with the most cutting edge technologies and, you know, whatever yeah, hormone profiles and the new peptides and new modalities, you know, like transcranial ultrasound, transcranial magnets, you know, how's hyperbarics affected, you know, the plant medicines, like all these things, like I'm always trying to, you know, push the envelope on there, but the most powerful thing I do is I, I have this PDF worksheet and I teach people how to get stress out of your sleep. Like how to, how to, how to remove stress around bedtime uh, mm. and to keep it away while you're, while you're in bed. And that is 70% of the results I get with every client I work with, like that stupid sheet. Uh, and, it, yeah. and it's, it's, it's a simple and, and we can. The simple you know, things that, though. We're really good at making things yeah. complex. Yeah. 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 And, and really, you know, I'll, and it's, it's a slight mind shift, uh, a couple of lists, uh, like we, it's a PDF. We can, uh, we can, we can give it to you for your, yeah. You know, for your audience yeah. We'll put it, uh, we'll put it in the show notes for everybody. Yeah. And, and y'all can download it for free. Um, and you know, and it, and, uh, you know, that, that's what I find is the biggest problem. And even when people don't think that's the problem, that's the problem, you know? And, yeah. and then I have this, this theory, um, I don't know how sound it is, but um, I've I've been spewing it for years. I don't know how to prove it, but it it, it seems logical. Um, you know, men men usually fall asleep no problem when they can't sleep. Like when they have sleep difficulties, they go to bed and they crash, but they only sleep for a couple of hours and then they wake up and then they can't go back to sleep. Uh, whereas women, when they have insomnia, they tend to get in bed and lay in bed for two or three hours before they can doze off. And my theory for that, you know, is adenosine is is the sleep pressure, right? So you're breaking down ATP, ADP, AMP, and then just adenosine. And like, 
enough of that build up in your brain and that causes the sleep pressure that even if your adrenals are sky high, like, you know, um, you know, like the only animal on the planet that sleep deprives itself on purpose is us. Every other animal only sleep deprives themselves because they're being stalked or because they're starving. Right. Um, and so, you know, it's reasonable to think we kind of have that same stress system, but enough sleep pressure and you can go right past that. I mean, you can have 90% adrenal funk, you know, put out output and then you're, and you still sleep for a couple of hours with enough sleep pressure. And so I think because men carry, you know, 30 to 40% more muscle mass, uh, they probably just have higher adenosine loads and the brain's about the same size. Um, and so I, that, that's my theory on that. I don't know if that's true. Um, it could have something to awesome, do with yeah. the com compartmentalization as well, but, uh, but it, it seems to be the case. And so I usually tell men, if you're falling asleep just fine, but then you're waking up and you can't go back to sleep, whether that's, uh, you know, middle of the night insomnia or what we call terminal insomnia, where you just wake up like two hours before you want to, and you can't go back to sleep. Uh, yeah. That's, that's almost certainly stress. And for women, if you're getting in bed and you can't, and you can't get yourself to fall asleep, that's almost certainly stress. If you're waking up in the middle of the night, there could be a lot of things. One, like one of the things, you know, of course, would be perimenopausal symptoms. And yeah, you know, there, there could be some triggers around that, but it, it could be stress in women as well. But when you say stress, uh, you mean like sympathetic, you know, you know like increase in, yeah. in sympathetics. Is it just metabolic stress? Is it like, can you, so I, clarify really that for people about, listening. I'm really, yeah, really, really talking about adrenal hormones. Uh, so of course, you know, cortisol. Every probably everybody's heard of it this, these days as the stress hormone, which everybody thinks is oh, that's a negative thing. But no, cortisol is very good. <laughs> like, uh, cortisol keeps you alert in proportion to your environment, right? So um, when you're uh, when you wake up on a Sunday morning and you lay on a couch and you read a book, you like, you just have a barely enough cortisol to be awake, right. And to be alert and to, be, and to read a book. But if, you know, if your a car crashed into the front of your house while you're reading your book, your cortisol would go through the roof, right. And it, because your environment's changed. And so that's what cortisol does. It keeps us alert in proportion to our environment. And, um, that's a good thing, uh, you know, and, you know, survival wise, which, it's not all that common for us now, but probably much more common for our ancestors is you, you know, you, you encounter something that's a genuine threat to your life, well-being or you know, people you care about life and well-being. And that we call that fight or flight, which is essentially the maximum amount of stress hormones you can secrete, right? And cortisol is the one we know of, but epinephrine and norepinephrine, you know, adrenaline and norepinephrine is essentially adrenaline for the brain. Um, like those have huge physiologic effects, right? They, uh, they make us superhuman in fight or flight because all that matters at that moment is getting away from that threat, right? So if it's, you see it, you know, a couple thousand years ago, you see a tiger, like if you don't get away from the tiger, nothing else matters. So a hundred percent of your body's resources are marshaled because of stress, right? So it's all your stress hormones, which then has feedbacks onto the sympathetic nervous system itself. And then the, those neurons themselves are uh, accelerating this. But you think about what happens, like your pulmonary tree dilates, you can take in more oxygen, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, peripheral vasculature uh, contracts a little so you don't bleed as much, your pain, re your pain uh, threshold goes up, your reflexes get faster, your pupils dilate, take in more field of vision, um, you're stronger, faster, more enduring, your, um, you know, your, your blood glucose is raised by cortisol, like right? that's elevating mm -hmm. And so you're sort of superhuman. So why don't you run around like that all the time? Well, because it's catabolic, you're using yourself as a fuel source and everything else that's anabolic isn't happening, right? You aren't digesting, your immune system's not functioning, you're not fighting off infection, you're not repairing, you know, damaged tendons, ligaments, organs, like whatever kind of uh, trauma you've had. Uh, you aren't even forming memories or you know, having cogent thoughts. Like you, everything about you is meant to get away from that threat. And so that's maximum stress hormones. The absolute minimum stress hormone you'll ever experience is during slow wave sleep. So stages three and four, or theta, delta, whatever they're calling them these days, NS2, three, like they're always changing the name for whatever reason, but there's basically slow wave sleep and REM sleep. And that's deep sleep and REM sleep. And deep sleep is the lowest stress hormone you will have during any 24 hour period. It's mm. the most anabolic period of your life, right? So when you're in deep sleep, 
your body's useless. The exact opposite. You're you're not taking in much oxygen. Your heart rate's low. Your blood pressure is low. You're you know you're not paying attention to your senses. Your, your blood glucose is balanced. Like all of that stuff, this fight or flight, the exact opposite. So you're digesting. You're producing anabolic hormones. You're producing reproductive sex hormones. You're you're uh, fighting off infections and parasites. You're repairing damaged tissues. As most people know, when you go to the gym, you work out. If you work out right, you come out of the gym weaker than when you went into the gym, right? Like the whole yeah, idea is to walk totally out the door depleted. Being, yeah, it's like if you if you walk out the door being able to do what you could do when you went in there, you didn't work out, right? So it's like right. you go in there, you you work out so hard that you aren't capable, you aren't as capable as you were when you got there, and that doesn't fix until you go to sleep. And so during slow wave sleep cycles, that's when all of that repairs, and you're getting rid of you know. I, I tell people all the time. It's, you can think of a single cell, right? The cellular metabolism is just a bunch of us, right? So we're taking in oxygen, we're taking in nutrients, we're producing waste, we're doing work, um, and we need to replenish things and get rid of waste products in order to be ready to do more of that, right? And so the whole point of going to sleep tonight is to repair from today and to prepare for tomorrow and so to rebalance all that. And so, um, you know, when you, get good deep sleep and you have almost no stress hormones and all that anabolic activity, you'll repair those muscles that you damaged while you worked out. And if you lifted a lot of weights, they'll grow back thicker. They'll grow back you know, more myofibrils to be able to contract a little harder. If you're doing endurance work, they'll increase mitochondrial density. They'll increase like uh, certain cellular you know, ports and receptors to make them more enduring. And that's how you get better. And your brain's very similar. Like your brain's repairing and pruning and forming durable pathways during REM sleep. And so sleep is really important, but you need that low stress hormone, you need that low stress state. And when you don't get enough sleep, right? I just said the whole point, I'm, the whole reason I'm going to sleep tonight is because I have to repair from everything I do to my body today, right? And then I have to prepare for tomorrow. My body's going to, body and brain is going to use a template of today, say, tomorrow we're going to try to be better. Be able to do that. Today. At what we Again. did today, we're going to try to be better tomorrow. Now, as we get older, we can't repair 100%. If you could repair 100% every night, you wouldn't age, right? You'd wake up exactly the same every day. So as we get older- I'm still 21. Older. I'm still 21, Kirk. <laughs> so we're, we're, less, we're less and less capable as we get older to repair 100%. And so tomorrow still comes. And, and, it, and, you know, and the contract you're born into when you're born is you're, you're going to die. Nobody gets yep. out of this alive period. That's it. And it takes eight hours to recover from being awake 16 hours. And that's just true. And yep. you can do all kinds of gadgets and put butter in your coffee and pop pills and wear gad, you know, eyeglasses and yep. things in your ears. You can do whatever you want, but you need eight hours still to recover. And if I choose, which a lot of people do in developed countries, if I choose to sleep six hours instead of eight hours, I've just chosen to age 25% faster, wow. but I've also given myself 25% less resources for the next day. Interesting. I still have to be just as alert tomorrow for all of the same things. If, but if I am less prepared, the way I compensate is by releasing more stress hormones. My adrenals yeah. make up that difference. That's why coffee works because coffee actually... It blocks adenosine receptors, but it also stimulates the adrenals as I'm releasing catecholamines and cortisol, and it's making me feel more energized. And that's what I need to do to get through my day. But now my stress hormones are too high to go to sleep when I need to go to sleep. And even if I'm tired enough to go to sleep and I crash because I have a lot of sleep pressure, my cortisol levels don't go down as low as they should. So that period isn't yeah. as anabolic and I don't and this recover is as much. And then the next morning... I'm worse and I need more stress yeah. hormone. And that becomes this is the vicious cream. cycle. Yeah. Yeah. It's a self licking ice cream cone at that point. It's like, you, know, <laughs> self -licking ice cream. Yeah, you, you can't sleep because your stress hormones are too high and your stress yep. hormones keep going up because you aren't sleeping well. And so yeah. I see this cycle. all the time. Yeah. You have to break that cycle. And you know, the, and there's things that are just beyond your control. Like this, you know, a lot of this is lifestyle choice and an understanding of, of how important sleep is. But I mean, you have bankruptcies, you have divorces, you have health yeah. crises with your family, like you have like whatever, There, like things come up to where 
you're not, you're too stressed to sleep for a while, you know, and, and, yeah. and you need help around those times. But um, it's like anything else. The lifestyle is the key, right? So, you know, I, I, this is, this is my soapbox. This is what I preach all the time, but I, you know, I sleep deprived myself probably 20, 30 days a year, you know, because I'm traveling to do a lecture and it's just like the, the only way I can do it is, you know, to get five hours of sleep and get up and go do this and that. And that. Uh, ironically, most of my sleep lectures are done when I'm sleep deprived, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I've done it enough to where I don't forget. things. And, uh, yeah, well, um, I think if you, I mean, I think if you do those other foundational things, right, you're eating right, you're, you know, doing breath work, you're exercising. I think right. there's a, a better level of resiliency to getting in five or six hours versus the people that are eating crap. They're not moving their bodies and they're not sleeping. This is like exponential, right? And, uh, and here's, yeah. You, you will impact. appreciate, you'll appreciate this. I know you, I know you're going to identify with this right away. Uh, just because of your career, uh, and, and your passion for fitness and you're going to see it. So, uh, if you take a group of healthy, health conscious, health aware go-getters and uh, you say, Hey, I'm going to sign you up for a research project. And next month I'm going to take away 70% of your calories, your nutrition, just it's part of a research thing. What are you going to do this month? <laughs> I'm going to eat a crap done. Stack it on, right? <laughs> and if I say next month, I'm going to cut your exercise down your activity and exercise down by 70%. What are you going to do this month? I'm going to train it up, right? If I say next month, I'm going to take away 70% of your sleep. People say, I'm going to practice sleep depriving myself. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm going to try to get used to it. And that's, and, and it's, and I don't know where that comes from, but that that's, I think that's the funniest thing. Uh, I mean, that, I've been laughing at that for 10 years and it's still funny. I, I don't know why people think that. I thought that as well. It's like, oh, because, you know, you think if you practice sleep deprivation, you get better at it. Not at all. Right. Yeah. Your self-awareness goes down. Right. When you're sleep deprived, it's very similar to being intoxicated. And in fact, there's all sorts of research where they you just get they, dumber and forget about it. <laughs> yeah. They parallel those things. And and if you know anything about uh, intoxication, when they do the research, around um you know things like duis and they're doing research on on people in controlled environments and they're giving them alcohol and letting them drink whatever um or when they question people who've who've gotten duis they're 100 percent aware of the consequences so it's not like a drunk person doesn't realize what's likely to happen if they drive home drunk they just don't care like yeah. they, it doesn't matter as much to them so their threshold for like true awareness of what's consequential in their life because your prefrontal cortex is impaired. Well, the area that's primarily infected when you're sleep deprived is your prefrontal cortex. And that's your simulator. That's what allows you to go. If I drive to home drunk, what am I likely to have? What's likely to happen to me? And is that worth it? Um, or, you know, what if I yell back at my boss or like whatever, like any kind of stupid impulse, we can simulate that or plan a path. Like I could do this for a career. I could do that. Then I would do this. And like that's all prefrontal cortex, but that's what's impaired when you're sleep deprived. And so when yeah. somebody, when you sleep adapt people, so take people who are well rested and then you, you take away two hours of sleep and then you, uh, test them on something or teach them something, uh, something novel. So like, you know, type with your left hand only, or, you know, push this button when the red and push this one when the green pops up and you know things like that. Um, or you can do strength and speed. It doesn't matter what, but any kind of test. Uh, and the first day they're, they've lost two hours of sleep and they will say, uh, like they'll do worse, of course. And then you ask them how they did and they say, I did worse. I was tired. Um, and then the next day you do the same thing and they say the same thing. And the next day, maybe they say the same thing, but by the fourth day they say, I'm fine. Like, I think I did as well today as I've ever done. And their performance has gone down just as much all four days. So your self-awareness, just like when you're drinking, like one beer, you're like, you're conscious that you've had a beer and you, you know, you need to think about when you're driving home Two beers, you're like, well, I better like sit back and have some water and talk for a while before I, but like four or five beers and you're like, ah, I can drive. Like nothing's going to happen, you know? And so it's, <laughs> it's kind of the same thing with sleep deprivation. And when, yeah. and when you look at being awake for 24 hours, that's on par with the blood alcohol level of 0.1. 
which wow. is really that's intoxicated. If you're awake for 48 hours, like you and I did all the time in medical training, you perform as though you have a blood alcohol of 0.2. And that's in decision making, problem solving, you know, predicting outcomes, all of that stuff. And so you, uh, you know, you really have to be aware that that you're compromised that way, even though you don't, you don't feel like you're compromised that way. And people go, well, I don't, I don't stay up 24 hours, I don't stay up 48 hours. Well, guess what? Sleeping six hours a night instead of eight hours a night for 11 days, you perform just like you haven't slept for 24 hours. If you sleep six hours a night for 22 days, you perform exactly as though you have been awake for 48 hours. Wow. It's just incredible. People just don't realize. And, uh, you know, in medicine, you're right. I, I get messages too from nurses, shift workers, people that, you know, they, they don't really have, I mean, they do have a choice. I don't want to say they don't have a choice, but you know, thank God there's people that work at night and work in the hospitals and work right. at the gas station. So we can fill our, I mean, thank God there are these people, you know, but it is, it's, I mean, it's a carcinogen. It yeah. decreases their lifespan. It increases their risk of every single metabolic disease. Like, I mean, this is well documented stuff. You guys, night shift workers get paid slightly higher than day shift workers. That's hazard pay. That is what that right. is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I mean, the, the who actually classifies uh, shift work as a type two, a carcinogen, which is the same as what they classified cigarette smoking, which means we're really sure this is uh, we're really sure this is uh, causing more cancer, but it's unethical for us to test it. So we call it, you know, a two a, um, but you know, shift workers on average die 12 years younger than their peers who aren't shift workers and people with chronic insomnia die on average 12 years earlier and people who use sleep drugs chronically die about 12 years earlier. Wow. And I don't think the sleep drugs have anything to do with it. I think it's just, those are just in people with insomnia, right? So the, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's the same. It's the same cohort, I think, and you're just adding the sleep drugs. It doesn't seem to make it worse, um, but it it does affect your performance. Your your sleep is way worse with sleep drugs, and so you're not getting nearly the quality of sleep. It's just like a hammer over the head. Well, yeah. Kirk, this was so wonderful. Uh, please, you guys, go follow Dr. Kirk Parsley on Instagram on on your social media channels. Tell people where to find you and where to find your work. Um kind of the the hub of it all just um so in the military everybody's a doc you know whether you're a corpsman and you've trained for eight weeks or you're a doctor and you've trained for 18 years you're doc everybody's doc uh and then my last name is parsley like like the herb so it's docparsley.com uh and then my sleep supplement that i developed to get, to get all the guys off of ambient and seal teams um you know that that's on that website, but that's called sleep remedy. And you can go to sleepremedy.com as well for that. Um, but we'll, we'll give you guys a link. Um, you know, say to like, whatever, be like docparsley.com for yep. slash Jamie or fit fabulous, fit and fabulous, whatever. Perfect. So, yeah. We'll link we'll it for you guys. So you guys can have access to that. Yeah. So you can dive in and start to you evaluate your sleep on, on stress. And then, and then my one parting thought more important than that, than that sleep stress worksheet, more important than learning about sleep hygiene and all that other stuff. Um, the most important part is to convince yourself as how, how important sleep is. So I usually tell people go to PubMed, go to Google Scholar, type in sleep and anything else you care about. I don't care what it is, like anything you care about, like sleep and parenting, sleep and work, sleep and making money, sleep. And, like I don't care. Any sleep and strength, sleep and um, sleep and lifespan and just read until you're panicked and go, okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now I, now I buy it. And once you buy it, it's a lot easier to make the changes, but it, it's really underrated. It's, it's impossible to conceive unless you really, unless you really study it, it's impossible to really conceive how detrimental sleep deprivation, just mild, yeah, what we would consider deal. mild deprivation of like six hours a night. Like that is catastrophic to your health and performance. A um, big deal. But, Probably 70, yeah. 80% of Americans do it. Well, you guys heard it. You need to get the stress out of your life. You need to get good sleep. We appreciate you all so much for listening. Please share this podcast with your friends and family, anybody who would find it helpful. And we will catch you on the next episode. Did you guys love that last episode of the Fit and Fabulous podcast? Well, of course you did. 
And I want to keep bringing you the most amazing content from the most incredible people. And you can help me by subscribing to the Dr. Fit and Fabulous channel. You guys know where the button is. Just click it. It's the doctor's orders.